as Greeks, the two most important nation states to which we migrated was the US and Australia. There's this idea that we are bringing something into this society which didn't exist and we want to keep that here and we want to make sure that that is somehow uh, perpetuated. But you also got you know, a level of racism within the Greek community. A subgrouping but an identity that was very strongly associated with their village and their place and their region. Australia was a nation of multi-cultures and multi-languages. Welcome to Think Greek. I'm Kyriakos Gold and we are in the heart of Melbourne in the Greek Quarter and today we're going to talk about Greek Australian migration. Join me. What makes people change countries? What makes people migrate? The most important reason for migrating is economic for most people. There are people who perhaps like the adventure, but most people don't like to leave the countries. One fundamental reason is economic. The other reason is self-esteem. To have a job, to be able to um, maintain yourself, help your family, is part of your, to use a rather technical term, um, identity of being, okay? So you enact being as an individual, as a member of a family, by being able to work, okay? And of course, when you can't work, you can survive. So people migrate because of economic reasons and because of reasons of self-esteem. That's one aspect. Now there is another aspect which perhaps has a more philosophical dimension. And this other aspect has something to do with uprooting yourself in a fundamental sense. When you decide to migrate, you uproot yourself from the space which has cultivated for you or you have cultivated for yourself a sense of belonging. In more recent historical times, this space is your country, your state, the nation state. For us Greeks, the Greek state. Okay? When you uproot yourself, you find yourself traveling your body and your body becomes an instrument, not a way of belonging, not a way of being, like it used to be in your country, but a kind of instrument through which you travel and through the use of which you try to survive. So most migrants are the labor, basically. But when you uproot yourself, you create a floating body, basically. So migrants are those who, if you like, float through the bodies. What is the significance of this? Migration takes place from one nation state to another nation state in modern times. Okay? And for us Greeks, the two most important nation states to which we migrated was the US and Australia. And by perhaps historical coincidence, both those countries are settler colonial countries. They enacted their identity through a perpetual act of what I call, in my word, and I can explain it, ontological violence. I'll, I'll come back to it. So when Greeks uproot themselves, they create floating bodies, and they move from one nation state to the host nation state, which is a colonial settler society. Because our bodies float, we are challenged by a question, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly. Explicitly, when we form collective bodies, like, for example, in our case, the Greek communities. And what is this challenge? Can my floating body be rooted again? And can I, as a Greek Australian, part of the Greek Australian community, become an aspect of the discourse of national identity? Okay? So can the migrant, can the Greek, for example, migrant, create a new sense of belonging? And as I'll try to explain later on, perhaps, this is a very complex exercise, mm -hmm. simply because it is not a challenge for a foreigner, it is a challenge for someone who is doubly a foreigner. Greeks are foreigners towards the host country, and they are also foreigners towards the rightful owners of this country, which are indigenous Australians. Mm. So things become very complex when we come to the so-called Greek Australian identity. So what are the, the main periods of Greek Australian migration? I mean, we've defined it as the, the gold rush uh, up to 1945, the big migration wave after 45. Um, 
the metapolitics and multiculturalism. We try to play with words between 75 and 2009, and then the new wave after the global financial crisis. Do you agree with those? Yes, more or less. More or less. Yeah, yeah. Historically speaking, they are not all of them equally important. For example, 19th century migration, more or less, before the formation of the Greek communities, let's say, which happened just before Federation, 1897 in Melbourne, 1898 in, in Sydney, we have individual Greeks moving around mm -hmm. Australia. Their stories are very important stories, very interesting stories, but in terms of identity formation and community formation, there is no really historical relevance. There is a romantic version, the first Greeks came here in the 1920s or whatever, you know, the gold rush after that, 1820s, sorry, that's, that's fine. But Greeks started thinking about the position as foreigners in this country through the formation of institutions. And of course, the, fancy, the first institutions were the Greek Orthodox communities of Melbourne and of Sydney. So they become participants in the creation of national identity, Federated Australia, through those institutions. And their things become very important, very complex, very interesting. Costa, do you know what's your take on identity of that um, era? Look, with regards to the first era, uh, I concur completely with George. It was really very much a seafaring situation where people would come, usually individual travellers. They were often seamen on ships uh, and so on. They set out usually from the islands that were British strongholds in any case and would find themselves um, in Australia. Um, with regards to identity, it very much was a self and other concept of uh, that dichotomy of trying to organise. Look, the first year at the start, there were a couple of issues. First of all, it was a male identity. It was primarily males who came uh, in the first year at the start. The other thing that was a big instigator of uh, movement in those years was remittances, remittances back home. And one of the things that I have noticed is that we really don't talk that much about how instrumental uh, that was in people leaving their country. It wasn't just that they were going to other countries to you know, see what sort of fate they could um, organise for themselves and perhaps a better life, a better future. They also had to uh, send money back or send gold or whatever it was that they sent in the first mm. phase mm. back home. And um, I think that is something that we need to uh, acknowledge a lot more informally. Uh, I remember, I'm sure you all remember that as well. Uh, I remember when I was a little girl growing up in the 60s and 70s, I remember my parents sending checks every week. They would get their pay packet and a set sizable amount would go back home. But even the initial seafarers used to do that. When we talk about Greek identity in the first phase, George, no one can exceed what George says on a philosophical level. But on a, a very, very practical level, in terms of identity, uh, people would somehow lose that sense of their identity, identity because they would change their names. Uh, they'd change their names and these people would, would pass away and we really don't know at the end of the day how many there, there were. They intermarried because very few Greek women uh, came out. Um, I, I did a little bit of reading myself before coming tonight and um, some of the women who did come out in the 1800s were quite extraordinary. They, were into, they had intermarriages and there are no doubt many, many, many uh, an ancestors of these people but we would never know. They changed their names and, and so on and so forth and, and intermarried again. But identity in the first phase was both very complex and really fascinating, actually, um, in the way that they negotiated. The other thing that I would like to say, um, I just, I was telling George, I've just completed a body of research that was published, and one of the things that absolutely infuriated me in my travels was that I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to do the palimpsest and talk about Indigenous people. They have brilliant historians 
they can talk about their own situation much better than I can. But um, one of the things that is really fascinating about that first phase is that Australia was a, multi, a, a nation of multicultures and multi-languages. In fact, the monolingual concept that we have of Australia was very strategically put into place at the end of the 1800s. Prior to that, this country was composed of many languages and many cultures. Um, there, was, uh, there were many, many aggressive um, stipulations put into place so that would revert, we would revert back to a monoculture and a monolanguage. And one of the ways that they did it was giving extraordinary support to British immigrants coming out. So Australia, in fact, for most of its history has been a multicultural nation. It's just, it was very well hidden. It's just a small white break, is yes. that what you're telling yeah. us? And I think one of the things that was really devastating, particularly for mm. Greek migrants, was that in 1901 with Federation, they thought that the many languages and many cultures would be somehow formalised. And of course, they introduced the white Australia policy. So this was quite a tumultuous time. And I feel so saddened that we don't have literary works from that time or memoirs, because I think they would tell quite a different story of the ruptures that occurred, particularly at the end of the 1800s. So there's less to celebrate in Federation than we may think. Look, I think Federation was devastating, certainly for the indigenous populations and their cultures and their languages, but I think also from pe for people who were not British. The Europeans were foreigners. They were never refer we were never referred to as Europeans in the 1800s. The Greeks, Italians, Maltese, Jews, they were foreigners. And the British were the British Europeans. Then what's your take in that first phase of Greek-Australian migration? What stands out? Touching on what Dr. George Vasilokopoulos said and also Dina, the thing that strikes me about this period is this. Generally, and I will generalise, people come to a country, as uh, Dr. George said, they uproot themselves. They're willing to embrace a new way of life, a new culture. They are making the conscious decision to leave. Our migration story, I think, cannot be viewed outside of the historical uh, progression of Greek people from ancient times leaving Greece, migrating and creating colonies. And the difference, I think, between other histories and other trajectories, and ours specifically, is that from an ancient time, we've established an ideology or a way of looking at migration that means that you can leave your country but retain aspects of that identity and take them with you. And I think it is that historical, if you like, perspective that informs the creation of these communities. Because not every ethno-linguistic community that lives in Australia has the same idea. They may, they may bind together for safety or for social aspects, but here there was always this idea that since there are enough of us and we exist in large enough numbers to be able to do so and make it viable, we want to perpetuate certain aspects of our original identity in this country. So even from the foundation of the Greek community in 1897, there's this idea that we are bringing something into this society which didn't exist and we want to keep that here and we want to make sure that that is somehow uh, perpetuated in this country. That's something that I found, find fascinating. I don't think we've actually extrapolated that to its full extent. Obviously, migrations are affected by what happens around countries as well. You are the token Pontian today. As I say, the president of presidents. What happened during that era with the genocide? Did that affect Greek-Australian migration as well as Greek-American migration? Yeah, there was... A huge migration, of course, uh, uh, for those who were fortunate, and I use that word in inverted commas, to survive the genocide. 60%, um, uh, rough figures, of course, 60% of the Pontic population of the Ottoman Empire uh, made its way to Eastern Bloc countries, Russia, Georgia, Armenia, um, Ukraine, 
as well. So, so then under 40% made their way uh, west, uh, and that includes uh, Greece as well as um, America predominantly. I don't know of many, don't know of many uh, Pontians or even Asia miners who actually Asia miners who actually made their way uh, from uh, that part of the world to Australia. There probably would have been a few, uh, but uh, that that time was a very tumultuous time, and we saw uh, the great depopulation of, of Greeks within uh, the Ottoman Empire. One of the biggest misconceptions uh, is that well, a Greek in, from Bondos would fit into Greece quite beautifully because uh, because a Greek is a Greek, um, and, and you know, and uh, the same level of difficulties, racism that we, as a community, faced here in Australia, many uh, people from Major Minor uh, faced when they went to Greece. Um, one of the things I tell people is um, is that you think of refugee crisis, and we worry about boats coming to Australia and a number of refugees overloading Australia. And Greece at the time had a population, I believe, of about three million people, and they had to accommodate one and a half million refugees. So you're talking about an increase of 50% of the population overnight, and then the, you know, the, the average Greek having to accommodate that major influx. So that meant less resources to go around, and Greece was already a poor country, uh, which would then lead to more stresses, more levels of uh, racism, of course, more division, and then uh, going uh, on what... Um, uh, George had basically said earlier on this whole concept of a floating identity and coming to Greece and having to forge a new identity in Greece. Uh, my father was told by his parents not to speak Pontian at school. Uh, it, it's just something he didn't do. You had to learn to speak Greek properly. If you're going to make it in, in Greece, you have to learn to speak the Greek language, not the Pontic dialect. So it was, uh, it was quite a... Uh, it's quite a tumultuous time. And, of course, many of the same uh, issues were faced by Greeks when they came to Australia as well, I would imagine, where they had to, where they were encouraged by many possibly to actually forego learning Greek and learning... So potentially that difficulty to establish themselves in Greece was another factor for them to uh, migrate in such large numbers in that second phase? You mean during the 50s and yeah. 60s? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would imagine that. Uh, uh, I think that uh, my, my grandparents made their way in the late sixties. My father was about fifteen when he came to uh, when he came to Australia. Uh, I don't because they predominantly were living in parts of Greece where everyone else in the village was a Pontian. They didn't really feel <laughs> excluded too much. But uh, but no. Um, uh, but then coming to Australia, you would find that I found that uh, coming here. Uh, many of the same prejudices ex existed, and now you're back in. The, now you're in a new country in Australia, and now you've got the same issues. Not only with, um, I mean, your 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 your, your, your dominant uh, culture here being your, your Anglo-Saxon type culture, but you also got you know a level of racism within the Greek community that has travelled way. We'll talk about that, and I'm glad that we've already put the seed of gender, and and subcultures. Maria, any comments on that first um, era? Um, I, I just say I found it very interesting. I must say it's not my strong point, the history or the philosophical perspective of that period. Um, but um, a lot of thoughts went through my mind as I heard each one of you speak. Um, obviously, my own um, experience and knowledge is very much around the post-Second World War um, migration from not only from Greece but from elsewhere and its relevance and impact on the developing Australian identity and, and the role that that's played in developing a sense of identity in a country like Australia which has its Indigenous ancient people's inheritance, its white settlement period and then its post-Second World War officially multiculturalism period, and now going into forward um, migration from our region and the very real possibility that in 30 or 40 years' time, Australia, its identity and its face will look a lot more like the region that it exists in and has existed in, um, in the antipodes, you know, in an Asian neighbourhood, a white 
settlement, which has changed profoundly. So um, that, that period is one that uh, interests me and it has an impact on the Greek identity because my experience and that of those who came post Second World War was I grew up being uh, a Lefkaviti, not necessarily Greek first, but from Lefkava. That's the context in which my generation or my parents' generation established themselves in and around their villages or their islands or what they identified with. So they introduced a, not, not necessarily a subgrouping but an identity that was very strongly associated with their village and their place and their region. And what a great way to close the first chapter of Think Greek, Greek Australian Migration. Join us next time for the big migration wave of the 40s. See you soon. So whatever money he made was going back to Cyprus. So they would say, you are the foreigner. I'm not a foreigner, I am the local. So they create a balance. And historically, we have been a uh, nation of migrants. Okay. So this community here, for example, is older than Federated Australia.